God, giver of life, you are the source of all of our strength and comfort. You've seen us through difficult times before, and you are the hope of all of our tomorrows. We give you thanks for this beautiful county we are privileged to call home. We are so blessed to be able to live in this place where every sunrise and sunset is so awe-inspiring. This day, we give you thanks for these men and women who serve on the county commissioners and all of those who serve behind the scenes, enabling them to do their good work. Their jobs are difficult, and they often serve selflessly, doing things that nobody else sees or appreciates. But we thank you, gracious God, and we ask that you would give the board your wisdom, your discernment, your help. Grant to all who come this night a spirit of cooperation and kindness and understanding. May we never forget your call to care for those who are in need. Help us to always hear and see and work towards a more compassionate and kind world. Help us to see and remember and serve those who are unable to help themselves. And help us above everything to keep in mind your will and continue to work towards a world that is more and more like your kingdom of heaven. Continue to bring us together as one people. Thank you for hearing all of our prayers. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Milton. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Aye. 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 The, the board received a request to continue regular agenda item 18, special use permit request S23-03. Request by Chris Baker, applicant on behalf of the Sanctuary Church of Wilmington, property owner for the use of child care center, seven points. Carolina Beach Road. So in R15 residential from the applicant, Chris Baker, to the August 7th, 2023 meeting to allow time for him to continue to make additional we required improvements to the facility. Um, is there any additional comments you'd like to make, Mr. Parker? No, sir. Okay. Mr. Chairman, make a motion we approve the uh, consideration. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. See you in August. Yes, sir. Number 13 is the um, consideration of the 2022 annual tax settlement. Ms. Snell, good afternoon. The 2022 annual tax settlement report. My name is Allison Snell and I'm the tax administrator here. This report is set forth and required by General Statute 105-373. These are the taxes. No movement. As soon as we can advance, we'll move forward. Mr. Chairman, while they're pulling that up, just want to acknowledge uh, this is our first official meeting with our new county attorney seated. <laughs> Looking great over there. Uh, Mr. Chair, while we're waiting too, um, I'd just like to notice for those at home and those in the audience here, we're having a little bit of a audio difficulty. We've gotten an upgrade uh, for our uh, sound system here 
And so we're just trying to work out the, the, the hijinks that are you know, in there. So please bear with us. You can see people scurrying about trying to get it under control. I could just go ahead and read it out. <laughs> Short, sweet. <laughs> Very old school, Allison, yeah. It's all good news. Commissioners, the presentation is in your agenda packet, and so she can run through it if you'd like while she's mm -hmm. waiting to follow along. Okay. That's fine. Right. So for New Hanover County, in our general fund, we levied $210,855,157.93. After collections, we are left with an uncollected balance of $898,003.86. This leaves us with a collection rate of 99.57% for the New Hanover County General Fund. For debt service, we levied $15,991,956.93. After collections, we are left with an uncollected balance of $72,262.61 for a collection rate of 99.55%. This is a quick graph to show you our collections over the past five years that you can see the increase and decrease that we have experienced. We'll move on to the fire district report out. We have levied $13,867,442.31. After collections, we're left with an uncollected balance of $72,824.04 for a collection rate of 99.47%. And this is a five-year glance at those collection percentages as well. This has been a phenomenal year for our tax collection team, and not just our tax collection team, but our tax office as a whole, because our collectors are only as good as what our assessors put on the books. And I'd like to say I'm so proud of my entire team for the good work they do, and I believe it has shown itself for you today. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir, Mr. Barfield. Ms. Allison Snell, again, as we said in our general review on Thursday, I just want to commend you and your team on doing a great job. Uh, Every year, you're above 99% collection rate. And what that means to the citizens of our community is that uh, when we levy a, a tax rate, uh, we're collecting almost all of the resources that are owed to the county, which indeed helps keep our tax rate lower because we're receiving what we should be receiving. And it takes diligence, it takes prudence, it takes uh, uh, sometimes tough conversation with citizens to ensure that those resources are, are collected. Mm -hmm. But as my Favorite author John Maxwell says, everything rises and falls on leadership, and it takes strong leadership in your department, which starts with you, to ensure that your team is in place to, to do the right thing and, and also make the citizens of our community happy. So again, Ms. Snell, thank you for your great efforts. Thank you, Mr. Barfield. Ditto for me, Allison. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Allison. I'd like to expand just for a moment on uh, Commissioner Barfield's and Chair Rivenbark's uh, comments, uh, but also it's the customer service that you're, uh, you personally provide as well as your staff. I know I've had several interactions uh, on behalf of citizens as well as myself and um, my small businesses that are there. Every time I come in that office, I'm treated extremely well and uh, not made to wait, and uh, we get the problem solved. And sometimes it's just it's not easy, but you make it feel easy and make everyone feel respected. I think that's a huge part of that 99.47%. And I thank you so much for the good work that you're doing and keep it up. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Mr. Chair? I'd like to make a motion that we approve the report as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. <coughs> The next one is the child 2022 child fatality, fatality presentation team report. Jennifer Grundy. Hello. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Grundy, and I am the chairperson for the child fatality prevention team. And I'm here to prevent, present the team's annual report. In 
1993, the North Carolina General Assembly established a network of local child fatality prevention teams, also known as CFPTs. The main objective of these teams were to co confidentially review medical reports, death certificates, and other records of deceased children under the age of 18. Each local team consists of representatives of public and non-public agencies in the community, such as law enforcement, guardian at litems, health departments, among others that provide services to children and their families. The purpose of the annual report presented to you is to provide a summary of the causes of death, the number of cases reviewed, recommendations for prevention, and team activities and accomplishments. The role of the new Hanover County Commissioners and the Board of Health and Human Services is to receive annual reports which contains recommendations and advocate for system improvements and needed resources if requested. In addition, to appoint members to the local team as identified by the membership. The year we are reviewing is 2021. Last year in 2022, we received notifications of 17 deaths from the year prior of 2021. Of these 17 deaths, one review was not completed due to a pending state fatality review. No system problems came from those reviewed. However, there were recommendations that were made. The first recommendation for prevention was the team recommended darkness to lights, stewards of children training for homeless shelter staff. This training would bring awareness and provide education on childhood sexual abuse to those who serve this vulnerable population. A team member has already reached out to the Carousel Center to facilitate training for emergency housing shelters. Secondly, based on concerns for rising mental health needs for our youth, we would like to bring awareness of the need for additional mental health services within our community. This recommendation was based on the concern that families are having to utilize patient services outside of our area. The team suggested that we share this information with our local leaders in this annual report. Members of our committee were concerned about the lack of local inpatient services for our youth. As a team, we felt that this was a platform for us to bring awareness to our community. Unfortunately, we are seeing younger and younger suicides. We have seen an increase in the number of suicides our team has reviewed over the years. In 2018 and 2019, we did not see any. In 2020, there was one. In 2021, we reviewed two su suicides that occurred. We feel that one suicide is one too many, and prevention is the key. We want to strengthen the con connections within our community to mental health services and support. You, our commissioners, have already addressed a vital piece of this by adding licensed mental health professionals in our elementary and middle schools. We would like to see access to local inpatient services for our youth to address more acute illnesses. These concerns are in line with the new strategic plan that addresses the importance of access to mental health services. The next graphic is a breakdown of the deaths between birth defects, illnesses, prematurity, and perinatal illnesses, accidental and undetermined. Under accidental, two of the four deaths were suicides. Over the past year, some of our activities and accomplishments included purchasing and distributing 10 portable cribs with child fatality funds to distribute to families with infants ages zero to six months. Parents are instructed on how to set up these cribs and provide extensive education on safe sleep practices and ways to reduce sudden infant death syndrome, also known as SIDS. The portable cribs were distributed by New Hanover County Health and Human Services workers with the Care Management for At-Risk Children program seeing the overseeing the distribution. The funding allowed for these cribs to be available for immediate use in the emergencies for after-hour social workers when they identified an unsafe sleeping environment. We had two of our members, 
attend the North Carolina Child Fatality Prevention Summit on March 30th, 2023. Our team is requesting appointment of a Health and Human Services Board member to the team as recommended by the Health and Human Services Board Chair. At our June 20th meeting, uh, we have requested this and we are awaiting appointment. In conclusion, I would like to thank you, the Board of County Commissioners, for the opportunity to share the successes and dedicated work of our local team as we continue to review child fatalities, make recommendations, and take actions to prevent future child deaths. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any board discussion? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. It looks like we're, asked, we're being asked to approve an appointment today, although there's not one recommended from you all. Um, are you one of the Board of Health to do that first? You want our board to go ahead and do that? Because according to our agenda, it looks like it, we'll make that recommendation. That is to be done by the Board of Health. Uh, and we're waiting for appointment for that. I just want to say thank you um, for that report and for the work you do. That's just such a critical thing in our community, um, and it's mm -hmm. sad to see that there's so much going on with our children, but thank you for, um, for being there and reporting on that for us. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, and let me step back real quick. I, I think according to our agenda, we're to appoint someone tonight, and that will be this board. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's the case, I would, I would nominate Linda Candy Robbins, who's on the Board of Health currently. She's currently a social worker within the public school system. I think she'd be the perfect person to serve in that role. Uh, I'll second that motion and absolutely agree with those sentiments as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All in favor say aye. aye. Is that aye. the social worker category? So, no, no, she's a social worker with DSS. They're looking for someone to be appointed from the Health and Human Services Board to this particular committee here. And uh, there was no recommendation coming forth from the CFPT yep. committee. And so looking at the folks that serve on the Board of Health, I just recommend that we appoint Linda Candy Robbins. Yeah. She's also up for reappointment on the Board of Health as okay. well. Mm -hmm. She can do both. She can do both. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 A strategic consideration for adoption of the New Henry County Strategic Plan fiscal year 24 through 28. Ms. Rigby. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here with you and talk with you about your new strategic plan. Um, as a board, um, you have led our community with strategic intent for more than 10 years. Um, you've led us um, through some challenges with strategic intent through Hurricane Florence, through COVID. Um, your strategic um, plan has also helped us be more intentional and purposeful with the abundant community resources that we have been entrusted with um, in terms of COVID relief dollars, um, and also in terms of uh, the community endowment that was established. Um, so um, we are looking forward to, to going through the plan with you. Um, as you know, um, you have accomplished um, from our past st strategic plan, uh, growing the tax base more than $14 billion, adding more than 18,000 new high wage jobs, ensuring our kindergartners are ready to learn through a robust pre-K program, ensuring our fire services and emergency calls are responded to in a timely fashion. These are all great successes that you have had over the past five years. And a lot of these are, are, or all of these are part of your previous strategic plan. 
In January, we reported out on these accomplishments. In February and March, we worked through our community survey and heard from our community about their priorities. Um, in March, we had a joint meeting with the executive leadership team and the Board of County Commissioners to really do the context mapping and the desired outcomes that you wanted to see over the next five years. Um, in April, we were able to meet with our Strategic Management Council. This includes all of the department heads and subject matter experts from uh, New Hanover County. And then in May, we met with a number of community partners as well as our Strategic Management Council to really look at data points and how to measure success. How can we make sure that we are accomplishing the vision that you have set out for us? So today, we're here in July after more than six months of planning um, to, to um, present to you the new strategic plan. We've outlined the vision for you in three focus areas. Uh, we've got workforce and economic development, community safety and well-being, uh, sustainable land use and environmental stewardship. These are slightly different than our previous five-year plan. These are focus areas or have been refined to better define the areas that you have the most ability to create transformational change. So for example, with workforce and economic development, linking education to workforce development as well as job creation and creating that cradle to career pipeline. Uh, for community safety and well-being, ensuring that our residents' physical and mental health are supported, and that will help us to ensure that we have a safe community. In terms of sustainable land use and environmental stewardship, balancing a growing and thriving community with the natural beauty and the features that make us unique and special. So in addition to outlining our aspirations, it's important for us to provide specific and meaningful objectives and targets. Uh, we measure what matters, and um, it's important for us to use good, reliable data sources. And so our targets that you'll see in the next slides are designed around just that, utilizing data that we have access to and data that is reliable. So over the next five years, we know there will be many um, new data points that we will want to collect and help us to tell our story, and we will commit to doing that. But these are the points that we have outlined for this first five years. Um, so with workforce and economic development, the desired outcome that we have is that res residents are provided equitable opportunities to connect to re education and highly skilled employment. We intend on doing this through a strategic objective of developing a cradle-to-career pipeline that ensures lifelong learning and employment success. And the way that we will measure this and our target is that, that we will maintain a county unemployment rate of 25% lower than the state, and we will achieve an average wage growth of 1.5% higher than the state. We also have an outcome, a desired outcome, about being a business-friendly environment that promotes growth, agility, and collaboration. And so we will do this through planning for the long-term needs of businesses through timely, innovative programs and community partnerships. Our targets around this are that we will maintain new business growth within 2.5% of the state and that county sales tax year-over-year -year growth is 1% higher than the state's. Our third and final outcome for workforce and economic development is around resilient infrastructure, and we want for it to drive economic growth and opportunities. We intend to lead the area in well-planned infrastructure creation and resources. And our targets are achieving a positive return on investment for our infrastructure projects or funding within 15 years. This is very similar to the previous measure that we had. We also have um, that the county has a GDP per capita growth higher than the state's. Question for you. 
a lot of conversations around infrastructure. What do you mean by leave the area well planned infrastructure creation of resources? What does that mean to the average citizen in our community? We want to make sure that as new Hanover County invest in infrastructure and you all have been um, doing quite a bit of that with projects that we've had. The new government center is a good example of that. But as we are um, developing in um, infrastructure and creation, we want for it to provide economic growth for our community. So we want for the county to be a leader in economic growth through our infrastructure investments. So an example would be providing water and sewer in the northern part of the county? That's an excellent example, yes. Just want folks to know exactly what we're doing in those regards to yes. provide that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In terms of our focus area around community safety and well-being, our first outcome is that every resident has access to services that support their physical health and mental well-being. We want to connect residents to individualized services at the right time with a variety of service providers. And so our targets here are that we want to reduce the top three causes of premature death, um, which is under the age of 75. Um, so the top three are cancer and heart disease and accidents. And so for cancer and heart disease, we want to reduce that um, 2% annually um, or 10% over five years. And then for accidents, we want to reduce that 1% annually or 5% over five years. We also want to achieve a mental health care provider ratio of 140 residents per provider to make sure that we're growing the capacity of our mental health providers. In terms of our next outcome, the community supports a life that mitigates health and safety risk. We want to effectively and efficiently respond to public health and safety demands. And so our targets are that 90% of our 911 urgent calls are dispatched within 90 seconds. We also want 90% of fire rescue responses to be in a timely, um, to be timely and to arrive within official emergency benchmarks. Our third outcome is that we want for our residents to feel supported and connected to their community. We want to build relationships and create opportunities that enhance engagement for a diverse community. And so through a community survey, we want to measure where residents report that there are opportunities available to them to build meaningful connections and encourage community connections through the services that we provide. Our Ah, there we go. I just had a quick question on one of the items you just went over uh, in the targets, the top one there. You mentioned the uh, achieved mental health care provider ratio of 140 residents per uh, provider. We generally look to the, you know, the private sector you know, to provide those providers. Uh, you, is there more behind that on how we anticipate we're going to be able to get, we would love to have more mental health providers in New Hanover County. Is there a strategy behind the strategy on how we can attract those? Um, I know money probably is at the bottom of that. Yes, indeed, there is a strategy behind that. We, um, you all adopted a mental health and substance use disorder mm -hmm. strategy almost a year ago now, and one of the items in that is growing the capacity of our providers. <laughs> There are a lot of partnerships that we can develop through uh, Cape Fear Community College, through UNCW. We have a lot of great assets here in this community. Um, there are opportunities to provide uh, scholarships and fellowship programs, utilizing some of the resources that we have through our mental health and substance use disorder fund, as well as the opioid settlement fund. Thanks. <clears throat> I just want to chime in on that screen as well. Um, I know these are broad bullet points that you have to drill down to to get the real information. But you know, looking at uh, providing folks with support for their physical and mental health, one thing I don't see listed here are parks. 
Uh, you know, every day we have a multitude of folks at Long Week Park and Ogden Park uh, that are taking, uh, and, and Smith Creek Park that are walking the loops that we have there, which, you know, they often say that walking in nature and a naturist place can definitely help reduce stress and provide mental health relief, as well as, you know, getting yourself physically strong. At Long Leaf Park, we put in a um, uh, obstacle course there, um, a ninja, ninja course there, a yeah. uh, basketball course there, and a multitude of other things as well. And for me, the, 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 the physical health is a lot more than just, uh, you know, the bullets that are here, you know, if folks are walking and riding their bikes, those things help to decrease heart disease. And so I think it'd be good for us to, you know, maybe just give some, a little more meat on the bones in regards to just what some of these things really mean to the average person that's watching out, out there. Absolutely. Um, our parks are an important asset. We have many um, community assets here in the, the county that do help to drive um, healthy outcomes and, and parks. Walking trails, uh, multi-purpose trails are excellent examples of that. <coughs> I'd, li I'd like to tag on to that. I was, um, Coastal Horizons had their reentry graduation Friday. And it's people that have been in prison. And they're in prison because of drugs. Some of them have been clean for eight months. Some of them have been clean for two years. But those are the kind of things that New York County's doing. The healing place. Coastal horizons. We got, we got so many more things than most counties have. People don't realize it, but we do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else got any questions? Thank you. In terms of sustainable land use and environmental stewardship, um, one of our outcomes is that through planned growth and development, residents have access to their basic needs. This is very similar to the concept that you all had in your previous strategic plan around complete communities and making sure that residents were connected to their basic needs through a variety of housing and transportation options. Um, here we have targets. We have 95% of residential units are within a 10 minute drive of health care, child care, grocery stores, and pharmacies. We also have a target to increase the housing supply to a level of one residential unit per two residents. The next outcome we have is that natural areas and critical environmental features are enhanced and protected. We want to make sure that development complements natural features. And so we um, have a target to reduce the number of residential lots that are created in our special flood hazard areas within the unincorporated county, and also uh, to reduce bacterial contaminants in our county creeks. Our third outcome is that cultural amenities that enhance our quality of place are safeguarded. And so we want to promote the community through activities that enhance life and connect people. So an increase in attendance at our county operated cultural and recreational facilities such as our parks um, and our libraries um, is our first target. And our next is that residents report their culture is valued here in New Hanover County. And that would be through a community survey. None of this can be accomplished without a strong foundation, and so we have a foundation of good governance that we have been utilizing at least for the past five years. Um, and so our foundation of good governance includes our shared values, which embody, are embodied by nearly 2,000 county employees, our business principles for New Hanover County to be effective and efficient, and all that we do to be easy to do business with and consistent in how we do it, and to be responsive and professional in our service. 
Um, we also look at our organizational capacity, how we hire people, the types of culture that we create, the capacity for data-driven decision-making, and a commitment to continuous learning. We have our internal business processes where we provide equitable, effective, efficient, customer-driven practices. Um, we align our services and programs with our strategic priorities. We communicate what we do and why and develop and nurture inclusive partnerships that deliver on our strategic objectives. I'd like to point out one new um, element of our foundation of good governance, and this is around responsible stewardship. As I mentioned previously, um, there have been a number of new facilities that we've had here in New Hanover County. The new government center is one of them. And so being a good steward of these resources is one thing that we highlighted here. So reducing our carbon footprint at our facilities um, reducing the carbon footprint of our fleet, um, and also utilizing innovative energy solutions whenever um, we have new facilities. Um, we also want to maintain a strong financial performance to minimize taxes and fees, to proactively manage to the county's budget, and to plan for the long-term health of the county. Um, and then, of course, our effective county management with our continuous focus on the customer's experience, increasing transparency and awareness about county actions, and delivering quality service at the right time. All of these are what makes the foundation of good governance. We've gone into measures for good governance. I'm happy to go through these if you'd like. A lot of them are um, uh, captured in an employee survey that we do every other year and so um, so we can go through those if you like I'll skip over them for now unless unless you'd like to go through them actually in regards to our carbon footprint uh, what are we doing with our fleet uh, I know that the governor came out with a clean transportation plan this past year. I was on that. I think someone from the planning department also participated in the conversations. Um, and the conversation there was around um, uh, having larger organizations, you know, change their fleet out with more energy efficient vehicles, whether it be electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles. I know DSS and I think the Sheriff's Department has the largest fleet in the county. And then property management is probably going to be third there. Uh, see Ms. Warmoth is here. What are your thoughts there in regards to that? And, and how sustainable is all electric vehicles for the county? Um, and if we go that route, are we looking at putting charging stations at county facilities as well? So good afternoon. Yes, a, a lot a lot of questions there, and I could probably talk for hours, but I, um, I won't hold everyone. I'll try to be quick and summarize. Uh, so we, we've created the perfect storm with our vehicles right now. So a couple of years ago, um, obviously when, when COVID hit, we weren't driving as much. So we did not purchase and replace vehicles. Well, then we all knew what happened after that. You couldn't get chips. So vehicles weren't made, less fleet vehicles were available, and we couldn't buy the vehicles we wanted. So we have an aging fleet. Our, our fleet right now is almost 10 years old on average for each vehicle. So that in and of itself is a very not efficient fuel cons fuel consuming vehicle. We do have some hybrids. Um, this year in our budget, um, we are going to purchase as many hybrids as we can if there's a model that obviously works for the need of that employee. Right now, it's starting to open up more. We're, we're able to get more vehicles. It's, it's starting to, you know, there's more on the lot. Um, we actually this year are going to put together a bid rather than just purchasing off a state contract or sheriff association contract. We think we're going to have better luck getting more hybrids by putting together a bid. So that's something if we're successful, we'll be bringing back to you for your approval. There are a large, probably about 23 vehicles that I will be purchasing for facilities management. Obviously, throughout the years when, when we couldn't get vehicles, we were making sure that we, of course, got vehicles for our customers, for Sheriff's Association and HHS. And those are my two largest customers, with our fleet then being the next largest. So we're going to do that right away. 
starting this fiscal year. Then we're going to start looking also at EVs. Our team already um, started last year with training on how to maintain EVs, obviously a whole different world than what they do right now for fuel consuming vehicles. Um, but we know with our goal set at 25% reduction of our carbon footprint for our vehicles, we're gonna need to make some substantial changes. Mm -hmm. Buying new vehicles, even if it is a, a fuel consuming vehicle, will help again because our fleet is so old. But our goal is to incorporate as many hybrids as we can. And then next year, once we have a plan for how we're going to build out our charging stations, and we're gonna have to do that at facilities like um, out at Division Drive, but that isn't just put in a charger and it's ready to go, we are going to have to upgrade some of the electrical capacity of the facilities to account for that. So that's why that takes a little bit longer, but that is all part of our plans. Thank you. So we're excited. So we'll be bringing more to you all in the near future with that. So moving forward in terms of reporting, one of the things with this strategic plan that's different from the previous is that this is on a fiscal year. And so this um, uh, plan, rather than having a report out in January as we previously have done, the report out would be in September or early October. Um, we would utilize July and August to collect all of the data and pull the report together through September and then provide you with a presentation on how we are working towards the strategic plan. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have or expand on any items you'd like to expand on. I, um, Jennifer, the, uh, in the, I guess it was the uh, Sustainable Land Use Environmental Stewardship, uh, you, you mentioned briefly uh, the goal of everybody being within a 10 minute drive of the, the services they need, et cetera. There is a, a strategy out there that's a, called the 10 minute city, which I think is different than what you're referring to because there's some controversy around that theory. Are we talking about the same thing or is that just a number that you pulled out? This is just a number, it is not um, related to that particular initiative. And, okay. and this really um, expands on your previous uh, strategic mm -hmm. goal around complete communities. We had within um, the, the goal that um, individuals would be within, I believe it was a, a half a mile and a quarter of a mile mm -hmm. of, of the facilities that they needed. Um, we've been able to take it to the next level, continuous improvement, and so um, we have a model now that our planning team is working and refining that can actually provide um, congestion and drive times in it so that we're able to have a little bit more sophisticated analysis um, on this, this round. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Mr. Chair, do we need to take any action on this, or is this just information? Is there any discussion? Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt our strategic plan for fiscal year 2024 through 2028. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All Thank opposed? you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Hearing text amendment request TAZ 23 04, request by Michael Faulkner with Castle Hain Farm Park LLC applicant to amend the United uh, Development Ordinance requirements pertaining to campground, residential ve vehicle, and RV park. This is a public hearing. We will hear a presentation from staff, then the applicant and any opponents will each be allowed 15 minutes for their presentation and an additional five minutes for rebuttal. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chair, members of the board. This text amendment is a request by the applicant, Mr. Michael Faulkner, to amend the New Hanover County Unified Development Ordinance related to standards for RV parks and campgrounds. 
The applicant is proposing to reduce the number of spaces in an RV park from 25 to 8 and reduce the minimum size of each space from 2,000 square feet to 1,200 square feet. The applicant has also proposed language that would update and clarify the minimum requirements for bathroom facilities and the area for laundry, vending machines, and the retail sales counter. While the applicant is considering submitting a project proposal if this amendment is approved, the proposed text amendment would apply to the entire unincorporated county and is not specific to any proposal or piece of property. New Hanover County currently requires a minimum of 25 spaces and a minimum space size of 2,000 square feet, along with additional use standards as outlined in the UDO. The current standards are geared towards larger scale campgrounds for itinerant use. They are not designed for permanent residential use or an affordable housing opportunity for people within recreational vehicles. RVs are not regulated for permanent housing the way that stip built modular or manufactured houses are. RV parks and campgrounds are permitted by right in the B2 and PD districts shown in red and pink. In residential districts shown in tan, they are permitted only with a special use permit. Staff have received increased calls and requests from the public for RV use in the county. Based on our records, there are only three RV parks in the unincorporated county. There we go. As part of analyzing the request, staff researched other jurisdictions' requirements for RV parks. These requirements are not consistent across jurisdictions. Reducing the, minimum, the number of minimum spaces allows for the use of smaller parcels of land for this type of development. Additionally, smaller boutique-style RV parks may be managed by an individual rather than by a company like a KOA. While most jurisdictions regulate the minimum lot size, this requirement varies. A smaller minimum space size requirement would allow for higher density RV parks. In reducing the number of minimum spaces required, this would allow for smaller sites to be used for this type of development. Shown here for comparison is an RV park in New Hanover County, Snow's Cut, which is developed under New Hanover County's current requirements, and Ocean's RV Resort in Holly Ridge, North Carolina, which has smaller minimum space size requirements. Staff also took into consideration the inclusion of amenities in the campground slash RV park, which can encompass restroom and shower facilities, as well as open spaces like dog parks and outdoor recreation areas. The latter are common in commercial scale RV parks. Staff also considered the tenancy of these types of uses. The intent of the ordinance is for campgrounds and RV parks for overnight stays, but the duration of the stay is not specifically defined. Other jurisdictions regulate this through the registration process in which tenants are limited to the amount of time they can stay in an RV or how long an RV can be in place on a particular site. As the comprehensive plan does not provide specific policy direction for this type of use, staff's recommendation is based on an assessment of the potential implications of the proposal. The recommended amendment is intended to balance the ability to ask for the use with safeguards related to potential impact on nearby communities. Staff is recommending this as a new use, campground slash RV park small, which would allow us to treat it differently through the conditional rezoning process with which we could add different safeguards and with a special use permit. This use would only be allowed within a conditional rural agricultural or a conditional R20 district. Staff recommend that campground slash RV parks small are subject to all other regulations for campground slash RV parks with the following exceptions which include the applicant's proposed amendments. Staff recommend keeping the language for structures in this subsection but including some of the applicant's clarified language. The planning board considered the proposed amendment at their June 1, 2023 meeting. The board voted five to one to recommend approval of the staff recommended amendment. While the planning board was generally supportive of creating a space in the UDO for this type of use, there was discussion regarding whether the staff proposed amendment mitigated all potential risks. Staff did receive an email which was uh, sent directly to the board. And this does conclude staff's presentation. The applicant is here to talk about the project and the application and can answer any questions. To reiterate, this item is not for a specific development proposal. Tim Lowe is here with New Hanover County Engineering and Stormwater, and Jamar Johnson is here with the WMPO to answer any questions that may come up under those topics. Thank you. I, I have a question for yes. staff. Um, you mentioned term of stay and that other um, areas or uh, counties had, uh, had recommended certain uh, lengths of stay. Is there a reason that you guys did not do that? 
We don't have it in our ordinance in our ordinance currently. Um, other jurisdictions just have they don't always spe specify a length of stay. They just regulate it through a registration process, which ours does as well. Um, and that their license plate number and ours does provide for that. So there's not a length of stay. Not in our ordinance currently. No, ma'am. Thank you. Another applicant. Good evening. Yes, sir. Is it just you speaking, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Please. Um, so this uh, is kind of in reference to what I'm trying to do to a two-acre property uh, that's just a couple miles from downtown. Uh, the current... Michael, can you identify yourself? Uh, Michael Faulkner from 154 Brentwood Drive. Sorry, thank you. Um, so the, the two acre property uh, with the current regulations would have been a special use permit uh, with the minimum of 25 RV spots, uh, 2,000 square feet each. Uh, what I'm trying to do is a more of a boutique homestead feel and only have eight uh, spots on those two acres. Uh, which then came up with the 25 minimum uh, re requirement. Uh, what the planning department has done, creating it a new zoning, uh, would allow for uh, more control over these types of sites uh, because I would have to actually submit, you know, for rezoning for that property and submit plans where right now it's just a special use permit. Um, there's a few things that our community needs. Uh, the um, there's not really any places for traveling nurses, construction supervisors, contractors, uh, people that are in town building solar farms, uh, cell towers, water towers. Uh, they don't really have a place to stay for three or four months at a time. Uh, most of the RV parks uh, around here are weekly and just in one month at the most. Um, there's also a need for RV park campground near downtown for those that are visiting. Uh, concerts or a conference uh, downtown. There's nothing like that around here. Um, it does help a little bit with people transitioning into home ownership or out of home ownership because it allows them a place to stay for a few months. Uh, from my understanding, there's no county regulations, but with state and, and insurance regulations, the most that someone can stay is actually six months. Uh, after six months, then it becomes more of a mobile home park, uh, which is completely different. So there is kind of the regulations of up to six months, um, but that's more insurance and, and at the state level than county. Um, another thing is that uh, by having more smaller RV parks throughout the county, it also helps with uh, to kind of lay the groundwork for infrastructure. So, uh, you know, if and when we get hit with more hurricanes and people lose their homes, uh, there's more areas throughout the county that we can cancel reservations and, and then use those spots for temporary housing for contractors or people that have lost their homes uh, while you know, their homes being rebuilt. So I think having more uh, you know, boutique RV sites around town, is, is it, it's a good thing for uh, preparedness. Um, and uh, I do think that based off of what we saw with the previous presentation, um, you know, the RV park, having a boutique R RV park, uh, um, you know, it's, it's looking out for the best interest of the environment compared to having the 25 RV spots on, you know, one piece of land. Uh, it's, um, it's a good thing for tourism, people that are visiting Wilmington. Uh, so um, I appreciate y'all's time, and if y'all have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. I had one, I know we discussed this the other day, but bathrooms? Yes, so the change with the restrooms, um, because there's only eight, uh, a minimum of eight spots instead of the 25, uh, instead of having, uh, because they are mostly RVs, everyone has their own restrooms on, on you know, in their RV. Uh, so the wording, instead of having a male and female uh, restrooms or locker rooms or uh, anything like that, uh, it, it would allow for a, for to have two uh, private unisex restrooms. Uh, so that way each restroom would be 
uh, you know, sink, toilet, shower, and then also ADA. Uh, so it makes more sense to have just the two unisex res restrooms instead of having, uh, you know, male and females lockers. So that's where that comes from. How about um, washing machines, dryers, stuff like that? Um, uh, so either ordinances allow for like coin, coin operated, you know, laundry facilities uh, and, and vending machines for the use of the guests only. So uh, no one else, no neighbors or anyone like that would be allowed to go onto the property and use the vending machine. Uh, I'm not sure if I have any plans to do so because there's two laundry facilities that are less than, a, you know, half a mile. Um, but uh, it, it, it would allow for, the, um, you know, the coin-operated laundry facility for the guest use only. Mm. Any questions? Uh, Mr. Well, Chair. Oh, go, go ahead, Rob. Yeah. It's fine. I'll wait. Um, Michael, when you say two unisex uh, bathrooms is what you're proposing there, are you talking about uh, mobile units, you know, like uh, the larger porta johns or what um, are you, do you have a septic system installed? Or are you connecting into an existing sewer system? So when this started about a year ago with the planning and stuff like that, um, the properties on septic, so the plan was actually to have one of those like fancy wedding trailers. Mm -hmm. That way it's self-contained and have a company once a week, every two weeks, uh, come and reset it. Um, my understanding now, uh, there's county water and sewage on both ends of our street. Uh, there was another project, I'm not sure what's happening with it, across the street with 49 units that was approved. So the water and sewage has plans to come right in front of this property. Mm -hmm. uh, so ideally, I would like to wait and, and be on county water and sewage um, instead of dealing with septic. Uh, but that was the original thought with how it said structures and, uh, and facilities. Um, but um, ultimately, my plan is to actually build a structure. Here's the problem. Maybe the question is really set for Robert. Uh, the, um, we're looking at a text amendment that would affect the entire county and not just your project. And I know that you're, you're tailoring it to your project, but um, something like bathrooms and Porta John's being used and accepted as that uh, is, is a far cry from what we have now. Of course, you have 25 minimum now, and you know that drives a lot more revenue, and so you can afford to put in a more permanent uh, facility. I get that. But dropping it down, I know the economics don't really support that. But the text amendment that's before us would, would open up that as a possibility. The other issue I have is uh, showers. If you've got what could potentially, as you pointed out, six months stay of somebody there, somewhere in there, I hope that they're going to want to take a shower. And you know, how do we facilitate that, again, with the text amendment, kind of crunching it all down? I appreciate in your situation, you've, you're talking about a two-acre area. My concern is, is that some people will look at this uh, and drop it into a single R20 lot, not even an acre, you know, barely more than half an acre. And what happens then, and what happens to the neighbors who would be you know, right there next door? So I, I'm sorry, some of that I, probably is for staff. Yeah. Well, there's still the lot size minimum, um, and then there would still be the uh, restroom showers, um, and and doing it this way <laughs> gives y'all that control over you know having to submit the plans uh, and voting on it uh, versus just the special use permit. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. I don't know if maybe Zach can answer better. Yeah. Zach, I'm sorry, I identified you as Robert. I didn't mean to do that. Yes, that's, that's okay. Yeah. Um, to to clarify the the language that staff is recommending mm -hmm. in the amendment does not allow for porta johns to be used. It, it retains the current ordinance language for structure, mm -hmm. um, which would require a, a permanent structure for bathroom facilities. Uh, what we kept from uh, Mr. Faulkner's application was the 
currently it just has two restroom facilities for the way it reads right now is separate toilet facilities for both sexes. He combined it and made it unisex, which we thought was fine. Um, and, but we did keep the language for structure as the ordinance currently stands. And what about a shower? It, the current ordinance does not state that there's a shower requirement. Mm. In your discussion staff-wise, did you bring up the possibility if someone is indeed living there for an extended period, which it sounds like they would be, how do they take care of that basic you know, daily cleaning? M most RVs, do you want to answer? Okay. Um, it, it's staff's understanding most RVs do have a shower internally. Um, this was not really part of staff's discussion. Um, these, and I'll, I'll let Rebecca answer. <laughs> So um, we actually had discussions um, mm -hmm. at two planning board meetings uh, about this text amendment. And one of the reasons why um, it was structured to require a conditional rezoning as opposed to a special use permit in the staff recommendation was because these types of answers are very site specific depending mm -hmm. on the type of project and the conditional rezoning process would be the opportunity for that discussion to take place based on the specifics of what was proposed. I see, thank you, Rebecca. Mr. Chair, I just wanna reiterate a point that Commissioner Zappel brought up just a moment ago. There seems to be uh, something that we just need to clear up that procedurally what we're addressing is not the specific project but a text amendment to our existing UDO. And why I'm a little bit concerned about this is that there's a lot of uh, overlap, it seems, from the applicant about that change to our UDO as well as its specific application to his specific project. But what I'm concerned about is the application outside of this specific project. I'm sure that Mr. Faulkner has uh, the very best of intentions and will do an admirable job, but uh, I, I don't know how this is going to translate to the rest of the county, and I don't know that we should be changing our UDO, our Unified Development Ordinance, to fix one issue with one particular project, and I welcome either staff or the applicant to address how that might look or work countywide and not as to his specific project. Yes, sir. So the intent of the staff recommended amendment was to, as Rebecca stated, for this to be a conditional rezoning. So every request would have to go through a conditional rezoning process, which means that it would go through the planning board and then this board to make the final decision. There would be a site plan attached to it and it would have to meet all of the standards that are set forth in our ordinance for that use. Um, so well, yes, it would impact the whole county, um, but it, every single time it would have to come through a process that, um, with which we have control mechanisms. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your question fully. It does. But my concern remains because I'm still seeing this within the context and confines of this particular project and I, I'm concerned about unintended consequences. I'm concerned about practically speaking, how a major change like this plays out whenever we're talking about how we develop undeveloped portions of our county, whether or not the needs for density that we have for housing are gonna be best met by this particular use because I think it would encourage this use more so than it is currently reflected in the UDO. Would you say that that's accurate? I think it's hard to say. We we hear requests for, for people to park RVs. We haven't had a lot of requests to operate new RV parks. Um, we, our records show that we only have about three in the county right now. Um, and so whether that trend will in, increase, I'm not sure. Um, but that is something we hear a lot of is, can I, can I park my RV on my neighbor's property or my property and live out of it sometimes? Um, and so that that is a, a crosshairs right now of this particular application versus trends that we see and calls that we get. Um, I'm not sure where I was going with that sentence. No, um, it's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. We're hashing it out. Mr. Chair, are we um, still in public hearing? Yes. Or 
we're not on our board discussion yet. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Zach, you, you mentioned the uh, planning boards or the planning staff's uh, recommendation. Had Mr. Faulkner not come forth with his text amendment, would the staff be recommending this? Would you all have thought this up? Probably not. Um, these ordinances have not, they were put in place in the 70s and updated in the 80s. So it, yes. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? <coughs> Thank you. We got four people to speak in opposition and I, let me just tell you, you got 15 minutes between all of you. So try to spread it out. But the first one we have is Terry Tom. Tom, if Good you evening. state your name and address. Yes, my name is Terry Tun. I live in this neighborhood. Uh, I live at 134 Victoria Drive, but it is uh, within a half a mile of this proposed um, <coughs> campground. I am familiar with camping. Spent a lot of time uh, doing this type of endeavor um, as part of mission work and things of that nature, and I've been to many parks and very familiar with that type of, a, of an operation. But I, I guess my concern um, with this particular site, which is actually operating right now. Uh, it's been operating since June of 22. There's campers coming and going from this site. Um, the gentleman has, has been sighted and, and, and clearly they're still coming and going. So it's, it's something that uh, is reflecting what we're seeing, uh, what you guys have all expressed concerns about. Um, my concern is that um, there's not, there hasn't been any uh, history of taking a site like this and putting it in a neighborhood. And he's currently advertising for tent sites and everything. And I mean, we, we are very concerned residents that we're gonna end up with porta potties and uh, mud being drug out into the street and, and people coming and going in our neighborhood. And it's a family neighborhood. And it's not a large neighborhood. so. Um, it's a very limited, uh, high density. I mean, most of the most of the homeowners are on an acre of ground, and and to put eight campers in there. I mean, there's currently four of them sitting in there right now, and it's just it, it's just kind of it seems like the legwork hasn't been done enough, and uh, we don't, we feel like you do that that this proposal is tailored specifically to this site. And dropping it to eight is because that's about all that he can get on there. I mean, if you dropped it to 15, he couldn't, he couldn't do anything there. But why are we at eight? You know, we jumped from 25 to eight. It just seems like it's tailored for this particular site. So there was a letter sent by uh, a Kim Brock to um, uh, Dane. I think he's on the planning or a commissioner or something. Uh, okay, anyway, so Dan, I won't go over it. I think you know about it, and I'm sure it got passed along. Um, <laughs> That's Mr. I, she couldn't make it today, yeah. and I wanted to make sure. I, I kind of got thrown into that one, Dane, so <laughs> sorry. I won't go and read the letter, but, but clearly uh, there is some documentation of already, like I say, this site is being operated currently. We've already experienced uh, the Sheriff's Department numerous times at this particular address at 134 Brentwood or 124 Brentwood and it's all in relevant it's all related to campers and people and and things going on in the neighborhood that have caused problems so you know that's our concern and I'll leave some time for some of the others to speak to so thank you so much for your time thank you sir and next next is Scarlett Spencer Good afternoon. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
I have read the yes, staff report. Oh, I'm your, Scarlett your Spencer, name? and I live at, I reside at 137 Brentwood Drive. Thank you. Um, I've read the staff report TA23 slash 04 text amendment application, and it appears that there's not um, any equivalent RV parks in the surrounding areas that could be looked at to determine the impacts this could have on an R15 residential area. Um, the intended plan to meet the needs of traveling nurses and small sprinters, which don't have bathrooms, um, and tent campers also included have the potential of becoming many trailer parks. Um, there are many other negative impacts being excessive noise at all hours, unsupervised children and pets roaming the neighborhood, people walking the neighborhood at all hours, day and night, and one of the most alarming, the potential of sex offenders, as they only have to register at their um, permanent residence and may travel where they wish by notifying the sheriff's office in their county of residence. However, it is up to the sex offender's responsibility to contact the local sheriff's department where they are visiting. If the sex offender is an out-of-state visitor, they have to notify the visiting county if they are visiting for more than 13 days. So my additional concern is if a sex offender from out of state visits 13 days or less, the sur surrounding community will have no notification. And there is also um, no way of knowing if a sex offender from anywhere will go to the county that he is visiting and report to the sheriff's department. And we are talking about a residential neighbor, a neighborhood. I'm a grandmother, a mother, and a foster parent. So I have many children in and out of my home, which is very close to this. And that, I'm sure, is the way it is across um, New Hanover County. Um, I, I would like to add, um, if I may, that the applicant, which you know, has been operating outside of compliance, and I have since July of 22. I know this because I've spoken with Andre Benet, I think that's how you say his name, at zoning. He's no longer with the county. Um, his supervisor, Robert Farrell, um, with no resolve. It wasn't until June of 2023 when we found out about the application for text amendment change and were referred to Wendell Biddle in land use. Mr. Biddle, along with our environmental, came out and it was determined Mr. Faulkner could no longer operate and must cease operation immediately. He is still operating with website intact and I've heard advertisements on the radio for Castle Hayne Farm Park. The applicant also has broken his own rule in his um, online uh, qualifications to stay there as to no one under 21, and there have been children in and out of that park. In the past two months, the police have been called to this site, result resulting in one arrest, another time for excessively loud noise, a music. Um, on another occasion, the EMS came and police were called, resulting in someone taken to the hospital. The residents of Preservation Point, a gated community which backs up to this site, have also called the police when the RV park guests were in their neighborhood uninvited. It is my observation and that of the Heightsville community that the changing of the text to include small RV parks in R15 neighborhoods, even with special use permits, could lead to the deterioration of safe family neighborhoods across New Hanover County. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Julia Jewell. Miss Jewel, y'all are down to seven minutes and 41 seconds. Seven minutes? And 41 okay. seconds. And, and 41 your name, seconds. Okay, and, I'll talk really fast. And, and your name I don't and, have a your lot. Your name and address? Um, I'm sorry? Your name and address? Julia Jewel, and I'm at 304 Palmetto Road. Thank you. Which is in that neighborhood. Um, I think a, a time limit, if, if one were to, if you were to adopt this, there really should be a duration. Um, as it is, it sounds like it can be six months, and I would 
say that please consider doing less than that. Um, also, that there not be any permanent RVs, which I question right now if there are not permanent RVs there. It would be someone coming and someone going. I'm against the whole thing and also changing the text, but that's some, a specific thing to consider. And as far as it offering housing, we have lots of folks, myself included, that offer short-term, long-term rentals for folks who are here for four months or, or whatever. So there, there is a lot of that available. Um, and if we were to adopt this, our neighborhood being rural, like I have, um, there's a lot of vacant land there. We could have a neighborhood clustered throughout with these little parks. And that would destroy our neighborhood, which I keep hearing one thing we want to maintain as a commission and as a county is the quality, quality of life for those of us who are here. And some of us have been here for generations. And we're watching it just go away rapidly. You all do a great job. But that being said, as we know, there's a lot of change. And so I don't think this is a good change. I think the restroom answer, that's all still very squirrely to me. I don't think there's adequate facility there. And the thing about water coming out our way, we've been hearing that for 15 years. We, maybe it will. But there are people there now. I wonder what they're doing. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Mary Spencer. My name is Barry Spencer. I live at 135 Brentwood Drive. Thank you, sir. Uh, I've been asked to give this uh, report to you my approach. And okay. It's a sheriff's office uh, report of. Yeah, that gentleman right behind you will take it, sir. So uh, I live um, not far down the street from where this uh, proposed um, mobile home park or uh, RV park um, would be. Um, and my concern is that um, wherever we live, and all, all of you, you pretty much know your neighbors or you're familiar with them. Um, if you have places like this that could go up all over the county. Anybody that has a half acre lot in a residential area could potentially um, ask to have one of these done. <clears throat> and there uh, are you know, uh, hundreds of, of lots, so you'd have to be dealing with this every single time <clears throat> that a person wanted to do this. Um, so, I know you got uh, probably uh, friends and family that live all over the county and all, and if uh, somebody wanted to do this next door to uh, one of your friends or family and all, it would uh, pretty much dis dis destroy um, the, uh, their, their peace, their, um, what they, they, they moved into that neighborhood for. And also, I'm opposing this and, <clears throat> And I hope that, uh, that y'all vote against it. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. Okay, the applicant has five minutes for rebuttal. Um, so I, I understand some of their concerns. Um, uh, what the one lady was talking about is full of a lot of falsehoods, and I'm not even going to uh, address any of that stuff. Um, one uh, concern, yes, uh, sexual offender, stuff like that. Uh, as a operator, um, I have the uh, option to do background checks on, on each person. Uh, that's something I plan on doing. Uh, I do plan on making it uh, 21 and up, but that's as an operator, that's, you know, that would be company policy. Um, the um, 
again, you know, this has something to do with, you know, the whole county, but on our, my one street alone is a gas station, a car lot, a diesel shop, a parking lot for trash trucks, um, you know, so, uh, and, and it does back up to a commercial property with a cell tower. Uh, so, and it is only within a couple miles of downtown. So it is, uh, it, it's that the area is gonna be developed eventually anyways, downtown can only grow out one way. Uh, there's absolutely been no, uh, uh, no uh, radio advertising or anything. There has been a website that was created for testing, marketing testing purposes. Uh, there was a Google page that was closed down at the request of the county. Um, and uh, anyone that has half a lot or, 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 or half an acre or one acre of lot, uh, you would still have to have the, the restroom facilities. So uh, not only would you have to have the restroom facilities built, but you would also have to have a minimum of eight RV spots. And you guys would also have to vote on the individual property. Uh, so it's not uh, kind of like the way it is right now, it's just with the special use permit, if you fit it, then you just automatically kind of get it from my understanding. Um, uh, a lot, what Zach had mentioned, it appears that a lot of these uh, ordinances for RVs, mobile home parks, um, have not been updated you know, in 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, the whole market has changed greatly, uh, with, uh, especially with COVID. Uh, technology, stuff like that. So there's a huge demand for traveling nurses. There's a demand that a lot, uh, a lot more younger people that are, are working from home uh, with their hotspots and stuff like that, that they can travel around. Um, so the market has changed greatly within the past few years. Um, and um, I think that's it. I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. Uh, the Does anyone want to, y'all got five minutes between all of you. Thank you again. Do you need me to talk, tell who I am, am again? No, sir. Okay. You're good I, I wanted to make sure everybody had a chance to talk. The other concern I have is everyone, this, this particular, these three streets, Victoria, uh, Brentwood, and Greenbrier are all still all septic system house, uh, houses. Uh, most single family, uh, most are zoned for uh, three bedroom. Uh, some may be four, but most are three. So the concern, another big concern I think that's kind of been overlooked and, and it may be part of the con congressional you know use thing. But the thing, you know, you bring RVs in, th they have to dump somewhere and uh, the, you know, there's no dump site at this particular site, so there's there, there's just another whole can of worms there. Uh, with it's one thing if they were to be uh, in a in an R an R uh, twenty that was on city water and city sewer, but uh, septic systems is a whole other uh, thing, and and clearly those are mandated by the health department. I know I added a bedroom to my home. And I had to jump through a lot of hoops to get that permit just to build that 400 square foot bedroom. So uh, for somebody to be able to just open up a, an RV park and start dumping raw you know, sewage into their septic system seems like, like it, I mean, it, it just doesn't seem normal. It doesn't seem like it would be uh, something that would be permitted. So um, again, you know, the thought is good about these smaller RV parks, but in this particular, I think there just needs to be a lot more homework done on on how we lay it out so it so it protects residents like us who have already experienced some of the repercussions of, a, of an operating site. It, this is an operating site right today. You could drive down there and there's four RVs in there, and that hasn't been even contained. So that's our concern. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Anyone else want to speak? Just briefly regarding the, um, there's such increased foot traffic and I'm in a unique situation because I have a farm that's kind of in the center of that neighborhood and all the neighbors you know, enjoy the animals and respect it and all of that. 
but I've had lots of young children come and they climb all over my gates and try to rattle my animals and they've told me where they're staying and it's at the RV park. And so there's a transient factor of, that doesn't understand like respect for the, neighbor, for the animals and all of that. So I'd just like to add that the age, age has been talked about a lot, but there are, there are many children. Thank you, ma'am. There are also two RV parks that are being built nearby, one on One Tree Hill Way and one on Sidbury Road, which are very close to that, our neighborhood. Is that it? Okay, I'm gonna close. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to clarify something that um, was brought up during the testimony. Um, I did want to make sure it was clear that there was a violation associated with the specific property. However, again, this is not a text amendment that would allow any specific approval to move forward. It is a text amendment that allows someone to ask and potentially pursue compliance within the code. It's definitely a board discretion. Again, there is no policy guidance in the comprehensive plan. There is not a lot of guidance in terms of what other communities do, but there are a few different conversations that have been happening tonight related to a specific parcel and the text amendment. I just want to make sure that it was clear to everyone. Okay, at this point, we're gonna close the public hearing. Is there any discussion on the board? Mm -hmm. This one here is quite challenging. I, I hear what Ms. Roth is saying. However, uh, the applicant started out talking about a specific project and property. Uh, I would have liked to have known that there were violations on the property to begin with. I would have liked to have known that someone's asking for forgiveness as opposed to permission. Um, and definitely want to know why it's continuing to happen when the owner's been cited to cease and desist, so to speak. And how we remedy those situations in the future when someone is using a property outside of its proper use and has been notified. Um, are there fines that are levied? Is it just a letter that's sent out saying we want you to stop doing X, Y, and Z? Uh, but I think for me that's important to know about in, in regards to what we're discussing here today. Um, Although we're talking about a text amendment for the entire county, again, the applicant is really looking at his particular property, and it's almost like, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, and trying to lay the egg so chicken can be birthed out of that egg is what we're looking at doing today, and something that I definitely can't support. But in the future, we, I know we don't have uh, minimum housing standards in the county. We really don't have code enforcement as the city does. You know, if these things were to pop up in the city, code enforcement would jump on it just like that, and swift action will be taken. Maybe we need to look at doing something like that in the future. But again, definitely want to know why we didn't know up front that this property was cited in the past. And because we knew we were going to be talking about this particular project, regardless of whether it's be something to be affecting the entire unincorporated parts of the county. Any thoughts? So I, I will say that um, the first time I learned about this particular complaint was in December and the applicant was sent a courtesy notice and notice of violation to cease operations. At that point in time, one of the, um, the ways to pursue coming into compliance um, is, has always been offered that someone can go through the legal route of becoming compliant. In this case, that would require a text amendment while that text amendment was pursued, the activity was supposed to cease. We did receive a report a few weeks ago that did not happen, and so an additional notice of violation was sent um, to make sure that the applicant came into compliance. 
based on staff's inspections because we've been out to this location multiple times. We've been trying to keep an eye on it and I think the neighbors have provided us some additional information at the end of last week that we are still moving forward with. Um, I, I suppose from a staff perspective, it's a little bit of a delicate balance, um, providing information on ongoing code compliance issue um, and whether or not it's something that y'all would want to know or not. Um, we've had applicants in the past that that has been the reason why a process has been started and we have not generally brought that into part of the consideration um, because they have gone through the process of trying to become compliant. This has been a little bit messier, but um, we can do so moving forward if that is the, the pleasure of the board. So to me, it appears that the letter doesn't do anything. If a so person can when the letter is sent, a deadline is put into place as to come into compliance. We inspect at that point in time. If the parcel has not come into compliance, then civil penalties start accruing. After a certain period of time, that has to move to our legal department in order to, to move forward with that. Um, so that is kind of where we are in the process right now as to if the property did not come into compliance and they are accruing civil penalties. So are penalties accruing now? Is that what you're saying? Correct, correct. And, and what are those? So it's $100 a day um, per violation for um, the first basically offense within a year's period. If you violate the ordinance multiple times, then it could be potentially um, $200 a day. And then we, we coordinate that with our legal department based on what we're able to actually enforce. So how do we make it stop? We have to have our legal department um, bring a suit if it doesn't come into compliance. This can be a long process to pursue something from a compliance standpoint. We don't necessarily have some of the, um, the same powers under our zoning regulations as we might under um, other, other regulations. Thank you. Mr. Chair, this is an easy no for me because whenever we are talking about this matter today, again, I want to reiterate that we're talking about a text amendment. That's really what we're discussing today. But it's not really about that. It's about this specific project because we keep coming back to that. I don't think that we should be in the business of changing our rules, changing our UDO to accommodate any specific person at any given time. We need to play fair whenever it comes to the entirety of the county and the impact that something like this would have on the entirety of the county. And I don't think that we could in good conscience move forward with making a change like this based on the information that's been given us to us today. So. Um, I am absolutely a no on this item, and I hope the rest of the board will be joining me in that regard. Um, if I might, um, I have to concur with uh, Commissioner Barfield's comments first. I'm quite concerned that we have residents who come and speak at a meeting, and they've been having concerns about what's going on um, on an adjacent property, and it's not been addressed. I think we should address these um, code enforcement issues mm -hmm. as swiftly as possible, especially some of the things that I heard is quite concerning. Mm -hmm. But I'll let, you, I'll let you guys handle that. Um, for me, um, we are looking at a text amendment that affects the whole county, um, and I don't think we should change our ordinances just because one person doesn't have enough acreage for what they want to do with them. Mm -hmm. To the thing, uh, to the comments about um, short-term rentals, there's plenty of Airbnbs out there uh, for folks um, to rent by the month or by the night or however they need. Um, I'm more concerned about the impacts throughout the county to our residential neighborhoods. That's my number one concern, and um, I would not be able to support this text amendment. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think you were, uh, first off, I share the comments here. I, that was uh, what the testimony from the neighbors is enlightening. Uh, and the fact that we they, this has been able to go on, we have multiple NOVs, uh, notices of violation that are active here. And it's concerning to me uh, that the applicant would come forward with that and that we would come forward with a positive recommendation on that from uh, even though we can't seem to control what we have that's happening under our own nose. But kind of pushing that all aside, I agree with Commissioner Scalise. We were actually here talking about a text amendment. 
All I can say is this is a really unattractive vehicle to bring this text amendment forward. Whether it was meant or not, what it's done is highlighted all the reasons why this is not a good idea. Because it's happening already right there. Everything from the, you know, the children running over, you know, to uh, unattended to Ms. Jewell's farm or, uh, you know, the sex offender you know, issue underlying it and, and that capability. There's, there's just a lot more discussion, I think, needs to happen before we really seriously consider this uh, going forward. And for me, uh, just as a kind of a looking forward, the question I'll be asking is this the highest and best use of our limited property that we have in New Hanover County? And what I've heard tonight, the answer is no. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. And well, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I know you want to make no, some no, comments no, too. No, uh, if not, um, I'm ready to make a, a motion. A motion to deny. Mr. Zappel, I think that we have yeah. to give the op applicant an opportunity to withdraw his application ah. if he so desires. Sir. Well put, Dan. Mr. Faulkner, before we proceed with the vote, I'd like to invite the applicant to the podium based on the board discussion and items presented during the public hearing. Would you like to withdraw your petition, request a continuance, or proceed with the vote? Uh, request for a continuance. I think there's a lot of um, misunderstanding with the whole way the process and that there's a lot of uh, there was a lot of gray area and I first started with having a friend visit me which is allowed in the county everyone on my street has RVs at their properties um, for the most part so um, the more I looked into the process is how uh, you know we realized there's a lot of stuff that needs to be updated and in uh, in a sense I was kind of informed that I was allowed within reason to kind of do what I was doing until uh, until there was a, until, you know, uh, tonight uh, to mm -hmm. see if um, it was going to be passed. So the intention of trying to uh, be sneaky or anything like that was not the case at all. Uh, it was in, kind of informed it would be up to tonight uh, to see if something like that could be passed. But I do think there's a lot of things that need to be uh, re-looked at. So I do think a continuance would be ideal. Okay. Question to the county attorney, please. Uh, Mr. Smith, if we were not inclined to grant the continuance, would we then turn to the matter that's uh, been presented and vote on that? I believe whether to grant the continuance or not would be in the discretion of the board, so you have the authority to proceed or not tonight if you'd like. I would not be inclined to grant the continuance. I don't think that this has been pursued in the proper manner, and I don't want to have these folks have to come back. We must start on the right foot whenever we pursue text amendments like this. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, we're going to encourage folks to do it the wrong way in the future. And I think that we need to make that clear tonight. Second. Is that, can you make a motion? It's, it's a, a motion to deny the request to continue. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? And then I'll follow up, Mr. Chairman, by moving to recommend denial of the staff recommended amendment to the New Hanover County Unified Development or Ordinance to modify the language in section 2.3, table 4.2.1, and section 4.3.4E2. I find it to be inconsistent with the goals of the 2006 comprehensive plan because this, the type of infill growth encouraged by the amendment does not encourage sustainable development or strengthen existing residential areas. I find recommending denial of the amendment request is reasonable and in the public interest because the amendment significantly increases where RV parks would be allowed and could generate additional impacts to the neighboring residential areas. Mm -hmm. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Resigning request Z23-11, request by Jared Covington with Hermitage Property Holdings LLC applicant and property owner to rezone approximately 17.9 acres of land located at 4012C, 4012 Castle Hain Road from R20 residential to CZDCS commercial services for a commercial business park consisting of 95,000 square feet 
maximum square feet of industrial flex space for offices, business services, and other limited uses. Yes, sir. Hello again. Thank you, Chair, members of the board. This is an application to rezone one parcel totaling 17.9 acres at 4012 Castlehane Road to a conditional CS commercial services district. Shown here is a zoning map of the area, highlighted in yellow is the subject property. It is located on the eastern side of Castlehane Road. This area was zoned R20 in 1985 when public water service was not available. Since that time, the I-140 bypass and associated interchange have come to the area and water utilities have been extended. Over the years, a number of properties to the north and east have been rezoned for heavy commercial and light industrial uses. To the west, across Castlehane Road, is the GE campus zoned I-2. Further to the east, along Hermitage Road, there is a conditional CS district along with some I-1 zoned parcels. As seen in the aerial photo, the property is bounded to the west by Castlehane Road. The parcel also has road frontage on Hermitage Road and is currently wooded. This slide depicts the current site showing road frontages on both Castlehane and Hermitage Roads. The applicant's proposed concept plan includes a maximum of 90,500 square feet of industrial flex space and a maximum of 5,000 square, 5, square feet of business services space shared across 10 proposed commercial structures. The square footage of the development on this site is capped and is included as a condition. The septic area is indicated on the concept plan. A 50-foot buffer is provided along the boundary of adjacent residential lots. The buffer will include both vegetation and a 6 to 10 foot solid wood fence. This buffer continues at a 30 foot width north of the Castlehane Road access point, and there is also a buffer where the site abuts the properties on Hermitage Road. There are wetlands and an existing stream on site. The 50 foot buffer on either side of the stream, as noted on the concept plan, is required by the State Department of Environmental Quality. The site has access on both Castlehane Road and Hermitage Road. The applicant has proposed that the primary access point will be on Hermitage Road. There are two projects in the vicinity under development, the Hermitage Road Flex Park and the county's Blue Clay Business Park to the northeast. There was a recent rezoning for a tractor supply store just to the south of the I-140 interchange. Development under the site's current zoning would generate approximately 28 a.m. and 36 p.m. peak hour trips. The proposal's total traffic generation would be approximately 91 a.m. and 93 p.m. peak hour trips. This proposed project's traffic generation does not trigger the UDO's requirement for a traffic impact analysis. Shown here are two examples of what one would typically see in an R20 development. And this slide shows representative developments of commercial services districts within the city of Wilmington. This property has frontage on Castlehane Road and Hermitage Roads and is just north of the I-140 interchange. Because of its proximity to that interchange, this area is likely to transition to a service node in the coming years, serving both local and highway traffic. To the east, the Hermitage Road corridor is developed for heavy commercial and some industrial, while the Castlehane Road corridor in this area, aside from the GE campus, remains largely low-density residential. The parcels surrounding the subject site are zoned for low-density residential. There are two parcels adjacent to the site that are owned by GE. GE also owns approximately 10 acres of land on the south side of Hermitage Road, adjacent to the approximately 58 acres of land owned by NC State University, which is used for agricultural research. The 2016 Comprehensive Plan classifies this area as both community mixed use and employment center. This project is generally consistent with the comp plan's recommendations for the employment center and community mixed use place types. The planning board considered this item at their June 1, 2023 meeting and recommended approval with the following conditions, which address buffers, maximum square footage of buildings, and limit uses to those which are more compatible with this corridor and adjacent residential areas. Staff concurs with the planning board's recommendation. Staff's recommendation is based on the guidance of the 2016 comprehensive plan, zoning considerations, and technical review. Lastly, I'll add that if approved, all development on site would be subject to technical review committee and zoning compliance review processes in order to ensure full compliance with all ordinance requirements. Tim Lowe is here with New Hanover County Engineering and Stormwater, and Jamar Johnson is here with the WMPO to answer any questions that may come up under those topics. This concludes staff's presentation. The applicant is here to talk about the project and can answer any questions. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, Commissioners. My name is Sam Frank. My contact information is on record with the clerk. I represent the applicant this evening. 
won't surprise you to hear that we agree with staff's recommendation and with the conclusion of the planning board. Uh, there are a few things that I'd like to highlight, but I'll do my best not to belabor the analysis that Mr. Dickerson has, has covered just now. With me this evening uh, are Jared Covington, a representative of the landowner and applicant, um, our land planners, Allison Engbrenson uh, and Brad Schuler, uh, and also Jeremy Blair, our civil engineer. I mentioned that to make the point that if there are questions that you have for us, for our design team, that are beyond the expertise of the lawyer, and you would rather hear from the landowner, a land planner, or an engineer, you will not offend me in the least by asking. Please do. Subject site is located in an area of town that is uh, identified by our policy documents and the future land use plan as ripe for this type of development. As you can see, it's located uh, near the Blue Cove industrial area uh, and also near GE. This site plan that you see before you uh, and the details of the conditional zoning that's been proposed to you are the results of significant collaborative effort between the landowner and staff. Uh, to identify appropriate details to address in connection with the design. It's not enough just to say that this uh, type of use is desirable under our policy documents. The details matter too. And it's important to me to point out to you that these details arrive after significant discussion and collaborative efforts between staff and the landowner over the last six months. That's also reflected in these proposed conditions. Um, the maximum total building square footage of 95,500 feet, uh, no more than 20,000 square feet of that for general office use. This is proposed flex use, and so as you might imagine, the general office use, uh, setting aside a small portion of that for our own operation of the site, the general office use will typically be incorporated into some other use. Uh, and so I mention that because when you look at the um, traffic trip generation numbers, the MPO did exactly what they must do in this sort of flex scenario uh, and evaluated the highest and, and most intense types of uses. The reality is there's not going to be 20,000 uh, square feet of standalone office space. There's going to be five to 6,000 square feet of standalone office space and then small office spaces that are essentially ancillary uses to the other um, flex space uses. Uh, the buffers. Uh, were, were more effectively depicted in staff's report than I can describe in text, so I won't mention those again uh, or in any detail. Um, proposed road crossing, uh, there is a stream that runs through the site, uh, and we propose on that, uh, on that stream to protect it uh, as we're required to do, uh, but for the nominal uh, improvements necessary to cross it uh, and to incorporate the um, stormwater management facilities within it. There are a number of uses permitted in the CS district. Um, that is the right district for this use and this location, no question about it, um, but the number of permitted uses is tremendous. And so through careful uh, effort with staff, taking into account input from the neighbors, we have developed this list of over 60 permitted uses in the CS district that will not be permitted uh, in this CS conditional zoning. As you might imagine, those uses are the things that people would find uh, noxious uh, or a nuisance to have in relative proximity um, to, the, uh, to the residential uses that are in the same general area. From a zoning perspective, the sort of default R20 zoning um, has piece by piece been consumed in this area. Makes good sense, the establishment of I-140 um, Castle Hayne Road, it, is, it has been developed in, in, uh, into valuable uh, commercial uses over time, uh, has, has sort of eliminated the, the need and utility of that R20 zone. But as you can see, uh, this site is in close proximity to an I-2, an I-1, uh, a B-2, uh, and a conditional B-2 district. Be difficult for me to explain the consistency with the comp plan policies more effectively than staff has already. If you have any questions about it or wish for me to defend those positions, I'm ready to do so, um, but I won't walk through the, the details of that slide as it's already been well covered. Future land use map contemplates this as an employment center uh, and community mixed use opportunity. Obviously, we are focused on the employment center side uh, in connection with what we've proposed here. The land has water service. It does not have sewer service. Uh, therefore, 
the type of higher density residential use that would go into a mixed use in this location is not viable. Um, and employment center use, though, is absolutely viable. Uh, and that's what we have chosen to pursue uh, and what we believe is the highest and best use for this piece of property. I mentioned earlier that uh, there's been significant collaboration with staff along the way. Um, and in addition to that, there's been some meaningful dialogue with members of the community uh, and evolution to the plan responsive to that dialogue. Perhaps the end results that you saw earlier speak for themselves, but I would like to draw a little bit of attention to those if I may. Um, one of the most significant is to shift the primary point of access uh, from Castle Hayne Road to Hermitage Road. Um, that is a, uh, a good design uh, decision, as is often the case. Our engagement with the community resulted in not just appeasing our neighbors, but also improvement in the design of the project. Uh, and that is an easy example to demonstrate uh, to you that uh, that primary access off of Hermitage Road will serve our site well. The, the buffers were increased in size, uh, and we got more specific about what we would build within them. Uh, again, there are some adjoining residential homes, uh, and it was important to us to um, protect and adequately buffer uh, the, the uses that we propose from those residential uses as a means for transition. In conclusion, uh, what we've proposed here is absolutely consistent with the future land use map, the comprehensive policy, uh, and is the result of good and collaborative uh, cooperation between staff and the applicant. Uh, we believe that we've proposed a solution that is uh, not only good for the community, also good for the landowner, uh, and the highest and best use of the land uh, as we see it. To the extent that you have questions for me or for the design team, we're here and eager to answer them. I, I want to know, is there anything going to be parked outside other than people's cars during the day? I mean. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Chairman. Could you help me clarify well, I mean, question? There's not going to be anything stored outside. Are you talking about in terms of vehicles or, or, or uh, equipment? Um, yeah. So... Let me, let me preface the answer by saying this is deliberately flex space. And so the specific users and the specific uses are not yet uh, identified. We don't know who the tenants are yet. Um, in terms of whether it could potentially be used as a, a lay down yard, um, it's difficult for me to imagine any other outdoor storage of equipment. Jared, does anything come to mind for you for outdoor storage of maybe landscaping, um, you know that type of that type of use is that possible? Come on, come on up. Let me introduce Jared Covington, who's uh, one of the owners of the company that owns the land. Okay. Jared Covington. Yes, sir. Uh, Five hundred four Dogwood. Uh, it's hard to say without having tenants in place exactly what uh, they would be storing outside or inside, but it would all be consistent with the zoning and what is uh, allowed within the CS district and with adequate buffers with the neighbors so that nothing would interfere with them. Anybody? I'm just, I'm looking at the list of things that we cut out um, to see if there's anything specifically responsive there. Is there I, a type I, I read that list. I'm trying to think of something you could put there. Right. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that warehouse storage, um, you know, interior flex use of those warehouse and light industrial spaces is what we envision but I don't want to tell you that it's impossible for there to be a retail nursery or, or perhaps even the sale of lumber that's, that's uh, stored outside. I don't think people would get tired of looking at plants and flowers. No, sir, I, I But I mean, if, you, if there's old, you know, wrecked cars and tires stacked up and things like that, they probably wouldn't like that. I wouldn't. A lot of those items we took out of the, the zoning so that it wouldn't disturb with the neighbors after we heard a lot of input from them. Just put yourself in their place when you ride by it every day, what it looks like. That's what I would like for it to look like. Yes, sir. We've done that thoroughly. Thank you. Rob, anything? <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry, Leah. Jeff? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, Sam, hello. Uh, yes, sir. Good to see you again. Uh, there are a couple of questions I had that were, uh, yeah, maybe for some of your specialists. You chose clearly not to try and capture the stream, but to allow it to, to run freely through the, the property and add some buffers on both sides. Uh, that can, can potentially be a problem, especially in a developed business park that you're having there, especially during uh, a flood or you know high rain event. Can you talk to me about that or what the thinking was there? If, if it's all right with you, I'd like to answer at a high level and then also sure. invite one of our land planners to answer in more detail. Right. Um, so first, that's an attractive and valuable environmental feature. Um, if we don't need to disrupt it, why would we? Um, and second, the capacity of that natural feature to handle water flow mm -hmm. uh, is also valuable, not only to our site, but to the community. And so preservation of that stream for both of those purposes just makes good sense. Uh, mm -hmm. That said, let me invite Allison Engelbretson to talk to you a little bit more about the thought process behind uh, the ultimate decision to preserve that stream. Mm -hmm. Good evening. My name is Allison Ingebretz and I am a land planner. I actually think uh, Jeremy Blair, civil engineer, may be better to answer this question if you mm -hmm. would let me. Sure. Good evening. Um, so with regards to preserving the stream, um, the Division of, of, uh, of uh, Water Resources. Well, yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, have pretty strict um, limitations on how much it could be disturbed regardless of, mm -hmm. of the type of development, whether it's going to be industrial, commercial, residential. You know, there's, there's only, there, there are limitations to how much it can be disturbed. And then these buffers uh, provide additional protection for mm -hmm. that resource. Um, with regards to the, the stormwater, you know, mm -hmm. flood control and, and other elements, um, you know, we've we've conducted, completed topographic survey on the site and, um, you know, evaluated at a high level, you know, the, the potential for uh, designing and constructing stormwater management facilities that will meet the county's requirements under the new um, uh, stormwater management ordinance and, and feel comfortable uh, saying here tonight that, that all those will be met as, as part of any design that would come forward through the development process. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I had a couple other questions, Mr. Chair. Um, Sam, the, um, the main, moving the primary site access, which I think is terrific, one of the major concerns I saw originally was that I know that that curve right there by McDougal is a dangerous curve along Castlehane Road, and so moving the primary access site over there to Hermitage makes sense. Uh, the buffering to the home, which would be, I guess, directly to the, I'll call it the east of that. I don't see a north arrow on here, but uh, the, the home that's closest to that. Uh, was there any discussion uh, internally on trying to increase the buffering of that? Because it sounds like that'll have a lot of truck traffic going relatively close to that home. Yeah, and as you can see, there's some significant landscaping incorporated there already. Mm -hmm. um, Allison, do we come on up? Yes, we held a community meeting with the folks that were all around the property, and there were some concerns brought up about the proximity of activities at this site near homes, but those were only the folks along Castle Hain Road mm. that were concerned. The people that live on Hermitage, there are, uh, I believe, three homes there. They had no issue uh, stated to us about the activity. And we explained the buffers were 20 feet minimum and we would preserve as much as we could. This uh, plan, while we're presenting it to you as, as the plan, Sam is right, we don't know exactly what will happen. So there is a potential that that could be pulled in, pulled away, but what we are saying is that it won't be any closer than what we're showing you here. Um, so, Allison, is there a yes. solid fence along with the vegetated buffer along that one, the main access site? That is one of our options. So if I might just describe all of the buffers just mm -hmm. in, in minor detail. 
We have committed to a fence for the homes that are along Castle Hame Road. That was one of the things that we agreed to and, and widening the vegetative buffer there as well. That was not necessarily discussed with the folks on the other sides. It is an option that is still available to us. There are three or four different options that we have through the Unified Development Ordinance uh, buffering, mm -hmm. and all of them meet the type A uh, buffer that is required of us. Mm -hmm. So we are required to put a type A buffer in that location? We are, yes. Mm -hmm. And type A would include a solid fence? It can. It does not have to. Mm -hmm. It either has three rows of vegetation or mm -hmm. a solid right. fence six to ten feet tall and then two rows of vegetation. Sam, would the applicant be open to uh, including a solid fence along that driveway? Well, I don't know, but I also don't know whether the neighbor would choose to see that mm. um, because that's not something that we've discussed with our neighbor. And so I do have a little bit of reluctance to mm. agree to a condition that might be unfavorable uh, mm -hmm. in terms of which type of buffer we utilize to our to our neighbor. Uh, that said, would you like me to ask the question of my client? Yeah, um, before you do that, did, did, have you spoken directly to this uh, homeowner? But I think what Ms. Engebrensen was explaining is that that homeowner didn't choose to participate in the, uh, the community meetings that we held. And they were contacted? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, it won't be necessary then. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Um, Trucks turning in the stream, and I guess that may be. Oh, that's it. Thanks very much. Anyone else? Thank you, Sam. There's no opposition signed up to speak, so I'm going to close the hearing. Thank you, any Commissioners. Board? Appreciate it. So, any board discussion? Mr. Chairman, I want to reiterate that I think that this. Uh, is as indicated previously, ripe for this type of development, and uh, I am in favor of this request. Mm -hmm. um, just a comment. Um, I think this brings commerce to the area, and I appreciate the investment uh, make, you're making in the northern part of the county. And I think it will provide jobs for those folks over there. And um, I'm in favor of it as well. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think this uh, project fills a kind of a, uh, an odd gap that we have here about light manufacturing or smaller manufacturers uh, that can support certainly GE and but other uh, manufacturers throughout the county. We don't have a lot of facilities or a lot of parks like this. So I, I see this as a really positive step forward. Before we proceed with the vote, I would like to invite the applicant to the podium. Based on the board discussion and items presented during the public hearing, would you, withdraw, would you like to withdraw your petition or proceed with the vote? Ask that you please proceed with the vote. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, I'll uh, move to approve the proposed, the proposed rezoning to a conditional CS district. I find it to be consistent with the 2016 comprehensive plan because the rezoning provides for the types of uses recommended in both the community mixed use and employment center place type. I also find approval of the project is reasonable in the public interest because the applicant limits uses to those which are more appropriate for the area and additional conditions reduce impact on adjacent residential areas. Do you need to read the proposed conditions? I can. Do I need to? You need to do that, John. Mr. Attorney, do I need to read the proposed conditions? Madam Chair, if you would, I mean, Vice Chair, if you would, please. Okay. The proposed conditions are as follows. A 50-foot rear buffer yard shall be provided along the rear property line of the abutting residential lots located on Castle Hain Road, south of Castle Hain Road access point. The buffer shall include both vegetation and a 6-foot-10 solid wood fence. Number two, a 30-foot buffer yard shall be provided along the rear property line of the abutting residential lot located on Castle Hain Road, north of the Castle Hain Road access point. This area already proposes building and vehicular use areas far away from the site due to the location on the on-site septic system. Number three, no more than 95,500 square feet of building area shall be allowed on the site, of which no more than 20,000 square feet shall be allowed for the general office use. Number four, 
Other than the proposed road closing depicted on the site plan, the stormwater outfall improvements, no impervious area or other stormwater BPM, BMPs shall be constructed within the 50-foot natural vegetated buffer on either side of the stream. Number five, all uses permitted in the CS district in UDO Table 4.2.1 are allowed with the, ex with the exception of the prohibited uses in the Table of Prohibited Uses including included with this application. Is there a motion? I think that was the motion. I'll second it. Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Five votes. Thank you. Okay, moving on to committee appointments, uh, Board of Adjustment. Mr. Chair, I would like to nominate Greg Uhl for the unexpired term, term expiring on 12-1-23 and Caleb Rash for the unexpired term expiring on 12-1-24. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Five uh, Mr. Chair, um, I'd like to nominate uh, Michael uh, Caleri and Thomas Crittenden uh, for the Class 1 journeyman and Class 3 journeyman as listed in the application. Okay. Second. Aye. 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 Uh, Mr. Chair, for the New Hanover County Commission on African American History, Heritage, and Culture, I'd like to uh, appoint Deborah Robinson from the Education Community. Second. All in favor, aye. 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 Health and Human Services. Mr. Chairman, for Health and Human Services, I'd like to reappoint. Dr. Virginia Adams, uh, Dr. Matthew Cox, Linda Candy Robbins, Frankie Roberts, Grant Smith, and then add in Laura Whalen and Lisa Lavoy. Lisa will cover the nurse position, and Laura Whalen will cover the pharmacist position. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? A little tough one here. New Hanover County Non County Agency Funding Committee. Stream, I recommend reappointing Linda Candy Robbins. Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 New Hanover County Nursing Home Community Advisory Committee. Mr. Chair, I uh, recommend that we uh, appoint Faye B. Jacobs. Or who's eligible for reappointment? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 New Hanover County Planning Board. Mr. Chair, I would like to move to reappoint Walter Pete Avery mm -hmm. and I also nominate Cameron Moore to fill one of those vacancies. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? We, we have one public comment. Otherwise, we are good on the committee appointments. Thank you all for doing that. Appreciate it. Okay, um, Kamoya Peterson from the Boys and Girls Club of Southeast North Carolina, they want to have their picture made with us. Mr. Chair, uh -huh. Ms. Peterson's going to give a short presentation oh, okay. first, and then the board, if they could gather to take a picture with her. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, Hi, I'm Kamoya. Uh, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Kamoya Peterson, and I am a member in the Youth of the Year of the, Bo the Boys and Girls Club of Southeastern North Carolina. I'm honored and proud to be able to tell you a little bit about my experiences with the Boys and Girls Club. The, the club has helped me achieve and get a head start on my future and has various programs that help benefit teens just like me. One of the programs that first comes to mind is Healthy Habits. It has helped us teens with creating 
healthy lifestyle choices. And about a year ago, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. But with the help of this program, I was able to turn it around in under six months. Another thing that they have is cooking class, which is something I participated in. Since COVID, I had a love for cooking. So doing this gave me new exposure to a hobby that I enjoy. Another program we have is Smart Moves, which focuses on our mental health. One of our members that has social anxiety shared that going on field trips with staff have allowed exposure to new and fun things and has brought him out of his comfort zone. The Youth Workforce Program is something that I've been a part of for around three years. This program consists of teaching us what the real workforce is like and how to be productive and learning responsibility for what it is to come in our futures. Working at the Boys and Girls Club has now prepared me for my first real job at Chick-fil-A. Being a member here for around seven years has given me a lot of opportunities and growth that I don't think I would have expected to have at this age if I went anywhere else. I believe being here has allowed me to learn how to give back to my community and has helped foster me into who I am today. When I won the Black History Art Contest and emceed at Breakfast at the Kids Table fundraiser, I gained experiences that gave me a push start. I have been on the news at least three times this year and the club has helped me learn about individuals who have made a positive impact and allows us as teens to become role models in our own community. These are just some of the ways the Boys and Girls Club of Southeastern North Carolina has helped benefit me and thousands of other teens that have attended. Thank you for listening and allowing me to share my story. Thank you. Come around, come around. Oh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I want to make a comment before. If you could step back to the podium just for a moment, young lady. I wanted to congratulate you, number one, on being chosen Youth of the Year. I had the opportunity to serve on the selection committee for both the local and state level of Youth of the Year, so I understand the criteria that's in place for you to, to arrive at the level you are now, and I assume you're going to go on to the state level, and I'm going to believe that you're going to win on the state level as well. Yes. Uh, I see nothing but bright things ahead for your future. You are just a dynamic young lady, and I'm glad you had a chance to come here to share your thoughts and, and what you've accomplished with our Board of Commissioners. And this will be televised throughout the, the entire month and in perpetuity, I mean, in per perpetuity as well. So you have a chance to see this, see yourself on our TV channel as well. Congratulations. Thank you. And, and Mr. Chair, if I might, um, you know, I just want to say I'm so proud of you. And to get up and talk before us like you did and speak to the commissioners is a big deal. Um, I'm a big proponent of the Boys and Girls Club, and I'm so proud of you. And I got a feeling we're going to be seeing a lot more of you in the future. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, very briefly, I just want to also say fantastic job on that presentation. You're a natural. You're a pro whenever it comes to making these kind of presentations. And I also want to recognize that Don Michelle Blalock, who reached out to us to make arrangements for you to come and speak to us tonight, is a really wonderful person. She's newly in the position regionally with Boys and Girls Club, and I think that she's going to make this great organization that much better. Thank you. Mr. Chair, yes, sir. I'd just like to echo all these comments I've heard here. We are looking very much forward for you to step into one of these positions one day. So yes, hurry sir. up, <laughs> get that education and come on back, all right? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, I want to congratulate our three assistant county managers. You all did a fantastic job tonight. I mean, you all made sure everything ran on time. There were no hiccups here. So kudos to you all. Just, mm, wow. Good job.